Welcome to a review of Land vs. Sea, a abstract strategy tiling game from Good Games Publishing, who we have to thank for sending us a review copy of this game. Land vs. Sea was designed by John Paul Jacques, who also did the artwork. Plays two to four players, with games taking under an hour, even at the highest player count. Land vs. Sea was published by Good Games Publishing in 2021 and has an MSRP of $30 US. This is a fun tile layer that some people might consider a next level Carcassonne. Or even a before Carcassonne, because at the basic game, I think it's even simpler. Now in Land vs. Sea, players score by placing hexagonal tiles, trying to complete land or sea okay. masses, with bonus points awarded for X's on the tiles, with a couple special features that let you take extra turns or steal tiles. Now, in addition to this basic game, there's also optional scoring systems, including trying to create chains of coral or mountains, waypoints, and connecting caravans and ships to make trade routes. At three players, the game adds in a new role, the cartographer, which changes up the scoring rules. And at four player, the game becomes a team-based game, with two players playing land and two playing sea. For a look at the excellent components that come in this tile laying game, check out our Land vs. Sea unboxing video on YouTube. Now, Land vs. Sea comes in a rather small box with a succinct and well written rulebook. The box has an insert that also serves as the scoring track with a small trough holding 60 double sided map tiles. There's also a small baggie of wooden markers three for land, three for sea, and one for the photographer. There's nothing to punch out in this game. Similar to Funfair and Unfair, also from Good Games Publishing, everything comes pre-punched. All right, pretty straightforward. Well, what are we doing with these tiles and tokens? So you start by placing the tile that's half land and sea in the center of the table. You're going to pull the Volcano Whirlpool tile, put it off to the side, shuffle the rest of the tiles, and split them into two full stacks. Randomize who's playing land and who's playing sea. Easy to do with those tokens. Now you're going to start by drafting tiles at the top of the, the two piles until both players have two face-up tiles in front of them. No players are allowed to look at both sides of their own tiles, but can't see the flip side of your opponent's tiles or the tiles in the two stacks you're drafting. for. Now the game starts with land, and they're going to place a tile, followed by C placing a tile, and continue back and forth until all tiles are in play. Now after placing a tile, so you're going to refill your hand so you always have two tiles face-up in front of you. Now, tiles are placed so the sides match, right? Makes sense. You're going to match land to land, sea to sea. These are six-sided hexagonal tiles. Now, when placing, what you're trying to do is complete areas. So if you're the land player, you're trying to complete land areas. If you're the sea player, you're trying to complete sea areas. By me, complete, I mean they're closed off on all sides. Now, these completed features score one point per tile with bonuses for any X marks or plus marks. I'm not sure which they're supposed to be. It looks like they're pluses in the rule book. They always look like Xs. Note. C can complete land areas and vice versa, but the points only go to the player that controls the area. So closed sea areas always go to sea, and closed land areas always give points to land. So while you can complete other opponents' areas, there are only a very few instances where you'd want to, usually after you've calculated some sort of trade-off in the points. Mm -hmm. For most players, you'll only be completing your own area until you're a lot more experienced. Yeah, sometimes it's worth closing off an area just so your opponent doesn't make it bigger. But you are just giving them points. Now, in the basic game, some tiles feature special symbols. There's two of them. One of them lets you place your second tile, which can lead to more scoring. And the other lets you steal a tile from another player. Now, once the last tile is placed, the game is over. Player with the most points wins. Now, there is one extra special rule with the Volcano Whirlpool. So if a player ever creates a ring of tiles that creates a hole in the map where all six edges of that ring are the same type. So all sea or all land, you then get to, for free, place the volcano or whirlpool tile. Now, this is a tile that contains a lot of X's on it. So it's worth a lot of points for whoever closes off that area. But no, there's only one of those doing double duty. So first come, first serve, which can hurt you if you've both been working on a six-sided area, as only one person is going to score it. And honestly, that's it. That's the basic rules for land versus sea. Now, along with these basic rules, the game also comes with a number of optional scoring rules that you can mix and match to add to your game once you've figured out the basics. You'll want to play the basic two-player game a couple of times first just to get the ideas and fiddly bits under your belt before moving on to three-player, four-player, or advanced scoring rules. Correct. And some of these advanced scoring rules are required, actually, if you play three or four. You definitely want to get them down while playing two. 
One of these bonus scoring versions is coral and mountain scoring. Coral scores points for seas, mountains score points for land, and you get these points for making chains of the appropriate feature. You're going to get two points per tile in the chain after the first one. These make a huge deal in the scoring, but can also distract you from other scoring formations, as you often need to decide which use of a tile will give you the bigger score in the long run. Now, caravan and ship scoring adds an area control aspect to and endgame scoring. A player scores two points when they place a caravan or ship next to another tile with a caravan or ship on it. And at the end of the game, you're going to look at each grouping of caravans and ships touching each other, count how many of each type of the tile you find. If there's more caravans, land scores one point per tile in the trade route. If there are more ships, then C scores the points in the trade route. If there's a tie, no one gets any points. Now, these are fiddly, and you need to pay close attention, in part because some of the confusing other graphics on the tile that aren't ships or caravans. And we'll get more into that when I get to my full thoughts on the game. Finally, we have waypoint scoring. Uh, each player gets a waypoint token at the start of the game and can place it on an incomplete feature at the end of their turn. Whenever this feature is completed, or the tile containing a counter is surrounded on all six sides, the player that owns it gets it back and scores one point. Remember to try, try, remembering to put it back out when you've collected it is one of those things that you really need to try and remember mm -hmm. to maximize your scoring potentials. Now, as mentioned earlier, all of these optional scoring systems can be mixed and matched. You could use one, two, three, all of them, none of them. Now, all the rules I just mentioned are for playing for two player only. Land versus sea can also be played and works equally well with three or four players. But there are rule changes for each player count. Note these are official variants right in the rule. They're, they're, they're part of the game. With three players, you add a cartographer. So you have land, sea, and the cartographer. This player drafts and plays tiles the same way as other players, taking their turn after sea. So it's land, sea, cartographer. They Land and sea and X's all work the same as in the basic rule. What changes is corals and mountains. They now score points for the cartographer and the cartographer only. And at the end of the game, where you're working out those trade routes, a tie, no longer are the points left, they go to the they go to the cartographer instead of being lost. So note, you do have to use those optional rules when playing with the cartographer, and it's also recommended you also use waypoint. You know what? It's very interesting twist to the game that, frankly, was much more engaging than I had expected based on just that little description above, basically. Uh, but again, it's not something you want to jump into without learning those basics first in the two-player game. Yeah, you don't want your first player cartographer, or sorry, land versus sea being playing the cartographer if you've never played before, I think. Now, the standard four-player game of land versus sea is played in teams. All the basic rules apply, including the fact you can't show anyone the back of your tiles. That includes your partner. In addition, you also can't talk to the other player about where they're playing, what they should play, excuse me, where they're playing, what they should play, or what side of the tiles to use. Now, what you can do, though, is you use waypoints. When you're using waypoints when playing four players, it's strongly recommended to use them because these become the main way to communicate with your teammate. Either you're telling them you want them to play in a spot or like, hey, look, look at my tiles and look at where I'm putting this because you can see I can complete this, right? Like that is your main way of communicating. Now, with four players, the score for each team is shared, and the winner is the team with the most points, either land or sea. Well, now that we've got a good idea of how to play, how about you share your thoughts on land versus sea? So I have to start by saying I am a Good Games Publishing fanboy. I'll go out and say it that far. Um, we have reviewed a number of their games, and none of them have been a flop. And like all other Good Games Publishing games we played, land versus sea features excellent component quality, clear and concise rules, easy to learn rules and i would say this is actually the easiest game by um, good games publishing to learn and features engaging and variable gameplay that has me coming back time and time again always interested to play again this is one of those games where i finish a game and i'm like want to go again and while it's not the same experience they always also make tabletop simulator versions of their games which are solid first party implementations yes. that can give you a good experience, if not quite the same one as a physical one. And for anyone who does want to try this game, it is free on Tabletop Simulator, as long as you've got a copy of that and it is a good implementation. And they even went so far as to link a, um, a Rodney Smith Watch It Played video right on the table. 
so you can even learn how to play the game while you're in tabletop simulator. Now, they claim that you can teach land versus sea in two minutes. And I got to say, I was skeptical at first, but I think it takes about that much time. Like, honestly, this is how you teach game. You're going to play a tile. If you complete land versus sea area, the respective player gets points. Then you're going to get bonus points for these little X's. Then you're going to draw new tiles. In addition, there's two special symbols to watch for. This one gives you an extra turn, and this one lets you steal a tile. That's it. That's pretty much all you need to know how to play. Now, I'm talking, so I couldn't show you those tiles, but if I had them in my hands, that's all you really need to start playing. Now, normally, I don't. I say don't try and teach games on Tabletop Simulator, but in this case, it really isn't even hard to teach digitally. Oh, honestly, this one works pretty good. Now, at the basic game play level, Land vs. Sea is honestly, in my opinion, the most accessible tile laying out game out there. Compare it to other popular tile laying games, I think this is a better gateway game for either new hobby gamers or non-gamers. It's great for playing with your extended family and with kids. That basic game is just nice and tight. It's one of those games, too, where you have that emergent gameplay. Stuff you don't notice the first couple of plays, but that start to sink in as you start to master the game. Things like the timing of using those bonus actions and stealing tiles, when you should steal a tile, what tiles you should steal, when it's worth taking two actions row and using the bonus, when it's not important and you can draft another tile instead. Hate drafting, which is sneaking tiles only because you don't want your opponent to have them. Also, just getting to know the tiles and the distribution. How many tiles are in the entire pile that have five land and one C on them, for example? Learning to look at the face-up tiles in front of you and your opponent and the face-up tiles on the drafting pile to plan your moves and also to try to predict what your opponent's doing. All of that is stuff that adds depth to this game that may not be obvious at first glance and first play. I got to say, with two experienced players, a two-player basic game of Land versus Sea starts to have that chess-like feel where you're actually out-maneuvering and out-playing and out-planning your opponent. Absolutely. There's there's so much strategy, even with that basic game, uh, before you add any of the additional aspects in. Uh, and in fact, almost with, uh, specifically before you add the additional yes. aspects in, which can distract you from some of that uh, that shape making. And, and it really so many ways to try and encourage someone to, oh, you know what? I'm I see they've got that piece over there. I'm going to put a piece here that's going to encourage them to expand that so that I can fill this in, steal a piece, right. and, you know, and, and, and fill in this much gianter thing while leaving them exposed. It's, exactly. it, there's so many great options there. Now, while the two-player basic version of Land versus Sea is good, to me, the game starts to become great once you add in those options. Now, of all the bonus scoring systems, the co Coral, I don't know why I keep wanting to say Coral, the Coral, and mountain scoring is my favorite to use. And honestly, I want to use that in every game. I really enjoy that added aspect of making chains, not just completing areas. One of the best things this does is also adds in an incentive to help your opponent out while trying to help yourself more. So it may be worth you putting down that additional mountain to score that, even though you might be closing off a C area or the opposite. And the game's no longer just about closing right? And stopping your opponent from closing. There's a whole other aspect to look for. And you can score a lot of points with those reefs and ranges. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, and again, though, it, it really does change up things because you're, you have to balance that. Do I want the points now for the coral or do I maybe want to leave this open so that I can close in a bigger spot with more X's mm -hmm. later? It, you, those decisions come up and, and you never honestly never know because you know, there you don't know what tiles are coming up to who. Yep. Now that is followed by the waypoint rules for me. Um, well, one point here and there doesn't feel like much. And every time I explain the waypoint rules, they're like, what, you get one point for completing it? Well playing, by the end of the game, those waypoint points can really add up. And it have actually, in fact, been a difference between a win and a loss in a couple of games I've played. That like you know it's within six points and well you only earned eight points for waypoints and that made the difference the only issue i've seen with waypoints what sean mentioned earlier is that new players especially and even experienced players tend to forget to put them out yeah there, there's a number of times where we've seen uh seen them used and it's it's they've been sitting on the table and you you 
as a good player, you want to remind someone, hey, did you remember to put that out? But also as the person who wants to win, you don't want to remind them to put that out, uh, even though you really know that they should always be out on the mat. You never want to keep it on the table. They really should. Now, of the optional scoring rules, trade routes is my least favorite. Um, But that's not to say they're bad or that I don't like the way they work. It's just of the three, I've ranked this third. I do love the added level of complexity and decision points added by trade routes. Like, I like area majority. I like that style of scoring. And I love to use them if I want to sit down to a competitive game, a game where I'm trying to outplay my opponent. I want to see who's the better player. The reason I don't use them every time, though, is they add a level of fiddliness to what's otherwise a very elegant game. Sadly, the caravan and ship features don't stand out well as the others in the game, and they can be difficult to spot on a growing map. In addition to spotting them, you also have to keep track of them and count them, right? So you're counting the different features and see, do are there more caravans or are there more ships? And then when there end up being multiple trade routes on different areas of the board, that can be a lot to keep track of. Is that one tied? Wait, that one's three, that one's this. And I find it adds a lot of AP to the game and a lot more staring at the board before making your play. And then again, this comes up at the end of the game because finding all the trade routes and scoring them is just fiddly compared to I look at the score track and see who won. Now, I admit we did hack our game and we now use wooden cubes that I happen to own from other games to mark out them, to make the scoring easier. But what I find is once you throw trade routes in, it's a much more serious fiddly game that takes longer. So if I'm looking to just have a fun experience, hey, let's play a game together, chat and hang out, I'm not going to throw the caravans. Yeah, I have to say, when I was learning this, even though we were learning on Tabletop Simulator, I was glad that the only time we put the caravan scores in was when I was playing the cartographer, and I didn't have to worry about them except for ties at the end. Uh, it was it was nice to not have to, to deal with that level of fiddliness, because once you get, say, four trade routes out on the map, you're just spending a lot of time looking at trade routes and, and thinking about, okay, I've got a trade route on this, on this uh, tile, do I want to go here or here or where, where is it going to, you know, where's the balance already shifted one way or the other? It, there's a lot of, of extra effort and, and potential AP involved. And what's, what's better do is it, is it better to claim this trade route at the end of the game or close off this area? That's going to score me 10 points. Now is that trade route going to grow. It just, excuse me. It's just an extra level of complexity. Yep. Now, all of these different scoring systems do interact very well together. And I got to say, they're fun to use in all the possible combinations. Like, there's nothing to stop you to play a two-player game of trade routes and no reefs. Or you can play a game with uh, waypoints, but nothing else. And I do like that, and I do love that all of these add a level of depth and complexity to the game that then moves it beyond a gateway game. And one of the things I like about this game, and like, I'm obviously not in this place, but if I had a new gamer and I gifted them a copy of Land vs. C, it's the kind of game that can kind of grow with them, right? They're like, I'm a gateway gamer. I just want to put tiles down and make me patterns. Great, but then once they're like, oh, you know what? I played this other game that has this area control. Well, now I can add that to my land versus sea. And as you learn more hobby gaming mechanics, you can evolve your game of land versus sea to match that complexity level, which I just think is a really neat aspect of the game. Yeah, I can definitely see that. I would be worried that uh, people would be tempted to feel like they aren't playing the full game without adding all the other things in and would be in a bit of a rush to add all those other sections in. But if you can, if you can understand that the game is just as real with just mm-hmm. this, and you can completely ignore all that other stuff uh, until you're ready for it, until everyone at the table feels they're ready for it, and you're still playing the full game. Yeah, these are all valid ways to play. It's not that this is an incomplete game without playing with three players or without playing with waypoints. Now, the biggest surprise to me, though, when discovering Land vs. Sea is just how well it works with more than two players. The three-player land versus sea is even more cutthroat than the core game. It's also more engaging to me because there's more to watch for. You're you're not only worried if you're land, you can't just focus on completing land, right? It's really easy to just focus on land, but you're going to probably be missing the fact that you're helping out the other players, that you're putting down mountains that the cartographer can use. And like, it's easy enough to keep track of two players. Once you have that third player in, it's definitely more interesting and then trade routes become even more important than ever and a handful of waypoints can mean the difference between winning and losing the only problem i've actually had playing with three players is that you're playing it if you're playing with people who are used to playing two player who are used to land and sea and using the corals uh, the coral in the mountains they're going to forget that the coral and mountains are now just for the cartographer 
and I've played games where I've had to remember, they put a tile out and I'm like, wait, remember, you're not going to get those mountain points. You're giving it to the other player. And that can be a difficult transition to someone who has played the base game many times. Fair. Absolutely fair. Now, my favorite way to play land versus sea is actually four players, which is a shock to me. It's a big shock to me because, for one, I don't usually like team-based games, especially team-based abstract strategy games. I don't know exactly what it is about land versus sea, but it does something different enough from other games that I end up loving it. For me. Now, the real highlight here to me is those communication restrictions. This leads to wonderful moments in game, both moments when you use a waypoint to communicate something and your partner gets it instantly and puts the right tile down and then you put the thing down and you get a huge bonus together. And when things go totally wrong, when you put your thing down because you're trying to say, I want to close that off next turn and they put something on that expands it out. You're like, oh, why did you play that? Both of those to me are wonderful moments to have come up in a game. The lack of communication is also great for a social game night hanging out with friends because you can't really talk about the game. So it opens up the table for all kinds of friendly conversations about how far you got in Breath of the Wild or the latest movie that just came out. Exactly. You don't have to stop all those other conversations. It's sometimes during a board game, people find annoying. It's like, oh, stop talking about what you're watching on TV. We want to focus on the game. Well, you have to focus on the game without talking. So might as well talk about what you watched on TV last night. Exactly. That makes the four-player game more of a party game. In a way, and note with a four player game, you do not have to throw in any of the optional scoring. You can just play four player. So, strongly recommend those waypoints because otherwise, there is no way to communicate with your opponent. Now, to offset all of this pretty glowing praise, I do have a pretty significant complaint about this game, and that's how busy the tiles are. In addition to the features needed to play the game in Land vs. Sea, there's all kinds of whimsical artwork on them. And it's inspired by historic medieval maps. And while I admit the first couple plays, I liked looking over the tiles and finding some pretty talented rabbits doing interesting things and discovering the Starbucks mermaid, these can actually get in the way of actually playing the game. While the extra turn and steal a tie symbols are huge, they're in the center of the tiles, which is great, the other important features can easily blend in with the other artwork. You notice this first with the X's or pluses, whatever they're supposed to be. In most cases, they're pretty clear. Like they're in bright white or bright black. So, you know, high contrast black, I guess is a good way to put it. It's pretty clear. But then there are a number of other like cross-shaped pieces of artworks. And yes, when you pick it up and look at it up close, you realize, oh, it's a tent. That's not actually an X. You can tell them apart well in your hand. You can't from across the table. Similarly, the coral and mountains sometimes kind of spread more than they should. Like, sometimes it's a little unclear at a distance if that coral actually touches a specific edge of your tile. Now, again, when you pick it up, it's usually pretty clear. It's like, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, that ends in this corner. That's not meant to go to this side. But again, it'd be better if you could just figure it out at a glance. If I look over and go, yep, that coral ends there. Yeah, and I found, again, on the tabletop simulator version that where I was learning, uh, because you can't necessarily, you know, bring the tile right up to your face, uh, there were a number of times where I'd planned something out and then as I went to put it down and you see the difference right there when those tiles are next to each other, you're mm-hmm. suddenly, oh, that doesn't actually work the way I thought it did. Time to rethink my entire strategy yeah. for, a minute, for the next four turns. And that was really disappointing. And it's something that is solvable. In my opinion, yeah, definitely. Now, the most egregious issue with this to me is the caravans and ships. Now, what they did do that I appreciate is these have white flags with little red symbols on them. And the only white flags with red symbols you'll find in the game are either on a caravan or a ship. I just wish they were significantly bigger. Instead, you got a little ship in the corner of the tile with a little flag on it. It's a little triangle. And I just wish they just blow it up, make those ships a little bigger. If you've ever seen me playing this game and I'm sitting leaning over the table trying to see stuff, that's me trying to figure out where the caravans are because I can't see it from sitting on a ta- at a chair across it. Now, I will say all of these graphic designs aren't terrible. They don't ruin the game. I just wish the important features stood out more. Like, I don't know, give them a drop shadow or give them an outer glow using Photoshop, something to just make the stuff that matters to the game pop. Though I do wonder with all this other artwork, if there's a possibility of expansion scoring being added to the game. That might be one of the reasons behind some of the other artwork, but I don't know if that's true. That's fair. Yeah, no, it's it's definitely, it's more cluttered than you'd expect 
Yeah. Uh, and, and it would make sense that there are reasons for this, but as of right now, uh, it just feels cluttered. Yeah, I would, I would definitely prefer a little more clarity, right? Being able to design this game, it'd be all hexagons with lines on it, and it'd probably work better, but then it wouldn't look as pretty, so I get it. So overall, we have been loving Land vs. Sea. Everyone I have played it with has enjoyed it, and that includes gamers of all experience levels over a rather large range range. The basic game, <clears throat> sorry. The basic game of Land vs. Sea is dead simple to teach and learn, and games play nice and quick without feeling like they're over too quick. At that level, the, the basic game level, this game is a perfect gateway or family weight game. Adding in optional scoring systems adds depth to the game without making it feel complex, which made the game really shine for the hobby gamers I play with now. The biggest surprise with Land vs. C, though, just how well it plays at three and four players, with a four-player team-based game being my actual favorite way to play this game. And it's interesting because we have talked about on this show a number of times the problems we have with rule variants when you have different player counts. Mm -hmm. It's been a complaint we've had. You know, don't if you have to make a rule variant for a two-player game, it shouldn't be in there. Well, this is the exception that proves the rule, I suppose, yeah. where the two-player, the three-player, and the four-player are almost different games, in and yet they all work so very well. What this does not feel like is that they tacked it on. They didn't throw in some rules to make the player count on the box sound more appealing to more people. This is a game that feels like it has been fully play tested and developed at different player counts and doesn't feature simple variant rules just to make it work. They are stand almost like Sean said, almost standalone game, fully playable, fully tested, just as fun as the original, if not more so. I'm sure there are people out there that are going to prefer the game at two, and I know at least one person that loves it most at three. It's the fact that it works at all of them that is surprising. Like when you see Land versus Sea, you think two player game. In a way, I worry that this is going to have the same problem Codenames Duet has, where people aren't going to buy it because they don't play two player games. That is the one downfall I do see with the game is that the, the, the branding to me is like, look, I'm two player. And honestly, I think it's better with more. Fair enough. The so Land versus Sea is the kind of game that's going to appeal to a very broad range of gamers. The optional scoring rules make this a great game for both new and experienced players, and also means that this game can grow with the group as they become more comfortable with hobby game mechanics. I honestly, at this point, have not played with anyone who did not enjoy this game. That said, where I think this game's going to fall flat is for people who like highly thematic games dice chuckers, uh, story-based games. This is an abstract strategy game at its core. It's about matching tile edges to complete patterns. There isn't really a story to be told while playing. If your group's looking for some kind of adventure or some kind of an experience game or to tell a story while they're playing, something they're going to be talking about for years to come, you're not going to find that here. In that case, you might be better off checking out Guildmaster from Good Games Publishing or, of course, many other adventure games that are out there. As for me, I just can't wait until we can start gaming in public again so I can start showing this one off to the local gaming community. I know a number of gamers who I think are going to love this. All right, well, that's it for our review of Land vs. Sea. Let us know what you thought about this abstract tile laying game in the comments. And also feel free to check out our more detailed written review over on the blog at tabletopbellhop.com. <laughs>